In the vicinity was some gravelly hills on which there was a little grass where I turned my horses. The next day started early steering west-northwest, crossing some ridges and passing some hills on our left. Just before night, at the foot of a small hill, we found a little spring, or rather, hole of water, furnishing a very inadequate supply, for after taking out some to cook with, I let the horses to it, and they drank it all. As there was no grass, I was under the necessity of tying my horses to keep them from running away. The next morning, starting early, a northwest course about one o'clock, I came to a little ravine in which was some grass and a spring here I encamped. The country since leaving the Colorado has been a dry, rocky, sandy, barren desert. As my guides informed me that we had a hard day's travel to make, I moved off early, keeping west down the ravine five miles, then southwest and west-southwest till one o'clock when I came to border of a salt plain and at this place found some holes of brackish water. After crossing the salt plain, I found a place where there was water and some grass and encamped. The water was in holes dug about two feet deep and quite brackish, making some new holes I found the water some better. The salt plain I had passed during the day was about fifteen miles long and from four to six miles wide, entirely level and destitute of vegetation. Presenting a surface of sand, the most beautiful salt was found in many places and within two or three inches of the surface. I ascertained that although the salt was found in a layer, it did not extend throughout the plain. In passing the plain, pieces of the salt were frequently thrown out by the feet of the horses. The layer was about three-four of an inch thick, and when the sand was removed from it, I found the salt pure white with a grain as fine as table salt. The next day, west-southwest, eight or ten miles across a plain, and entered the dry bed of a river on each side high hills. Pursuing my course along the valley of this river eight or nine miles, I encamped. In the channel of the river, I occasionally found water. It runs from west to east, alternately running on the surface and disappearing entirely in the sands of its bed, leaving them for miles entirely dry. Near the place where I entered its bed, it seemed to finally lose itself in the plain. It is perhaps reasonable to suppose that the salt plain has been formed by the waters of this river overflowing the level country in its freshets, and in the dry season sinking in the sand and leaving a deposit of salt on the surface. The waters of the river at this place are sufficiently salt to justify this conclusion. At this time my provision was nearly exhausted, although I thought I had provided enough to last me ten or twelve days. But men accustomed to living on meat, and at the same time traveling hard, will eat a surprising quantity of corn and beans, which at this time constituted our principal subsistence. One of my guides said he knew where his people had a cache of some provision, and the next day, as I traveled on, he went with one of the men to procure some at night. They returned, bringing something that resembled in appearance loaves of bread, weighing each eight or ten pounds. It was so hard that an axe was required to break it, and in taste resembled sugar candy. It was no doubt sugar, but in that imperfect form in which it is found among nations to which the art of granulation is unknown. On inquiry, I found it was made from the cane grass which I have before spoken of on Adam's River, and the same of which the Amuchabas make their arrows. For three days, nothing material occurred. Our course was up the river, which sometimes run in sight and then for miles disappeared in the sands. In places, I found grass and the sugar cane, and in some places, small cottonwood. I also saw the tracks of horses that had been here during the summer. My guides belonged to a tribe of Indians residing in the vicinity called the Wanyumas, not numerous for this barren country could not support them. At this place was some sign of antelope and mountain sheep. Mr. Rogers killed an antelope which tasted quite strong of wormwood. On the fourth night from the salt plain, an Amuchaba Indian that had come this far with me disappeared. I suppose he had become tired of the journey and returned. My guides had expected to find their families here, but were disappointed. The next day, still following the course of the river, which had a strong current in places twenty yards in width, and in others entirely disappeared in the sands. After a long day's travel, I arrived late at a Wan Yuma lodge. Close by were two or three families of the same tribe. Here I remained the following day, and in the meantime was well treated by these Indians. They gave us such food as they had consisting of a kind of mush made of acorns and pine nuts bread, 
made of a small berry. This bread in appearance was like cornbread, but in taste much sweeter. As there were in the neighborhood a plenty of hares, the Indians said they must give us a feast. Several went out for this purpose with a net eighty or one hundred yards long. Arriving at a place where they knew them to be plenty, the net was extended among the wormwood. Then divided on each wing, they moved in such direction as to force the frightened game to the net where they were taken while entangled in its meshes. Being out but a short time, they brought in two or three dozen, a part of which they gave me. Seeing some tracks of antelope, Mr. Rogers and myself went out and killed two. In this vicinity, there are some groves of cottonwood and in places sugarcane and grass. On the following day, after making the Indians some presents, I moved on keeping a right-hand fork my course nearly southwest, passing out at the head of this creek, and over a ridge I entered a ravine running southwest. I proceeded down it nearly to where it entered some high hills, which were apparently covered with pine. At this place I encamped. In the course of the days I passed hills covered with a scattering growth of bastard cedar and bushy oak. Some antelopes were seen in the course of the day and the tracks of bear and black-tailed deer. The next day, following the valley of a creek, alternately sinking and rising and passing through a range of mountain for eight miles, where I was obliged to travel in the bed of the creek, as the hills on both sides, which were thick covered with cedar, came in close and rugged to the creek. About ten miles from camp, I came out into a large valley having no timber except what was on the creeks coming from the mountains. Here we found a plenty of grass, and what was still more pleasing, we began to see track of horses and cattle, and shortly after saw some fine herds of cattle in many directions. As those sure evidences of civilization passed in sight, they awakened many emotions in my mind, and some of them not the most pleasant. It would perhaps be supposed that after numerous hardships endured in a savage and inhospitable desert, I should hail the herds that were passing before me in the valley as harbingers of better times. But they reminded me that I was approaching a country inhabited by Spaniards, a people whose distinguishing characteristic has ever been jealousy, a people of different religion from mine, and possessing a full share of that bigotry and disregard of the rights of a Protestant that has at times stained the Catholic religion. They might perhaps consider me a spy, imprison me, persecute me for the sake of religion, or detain me in prison to the ruin of my business I knew such things had been and might be again. Yet confiding in the rectitude of my intentions, I endeavored to convince myself that I should be able to make it appear to them that I had come to their country as the only means by which I could extricate myself from my own embarrassing situation, and that so far from being a spy, my only wish was to procure such supplies as would enable me to proceed to my own country. When we left the mountains, our course was west-southwest. Close on the right was a range of mountains out of which poured several beautiful streams, watering a fertile valley extending many miles on the left. Having traveled about eighteen miles, I encamped. We had nothing to eat, and knowing that it would take two days to reach the settlements, I determined to help myself to one of the hundreds of fine cattle in view. In endeavoring to kill one, I had to use all the precaution necessary in approaching buffalo. Having succeeded, I found the animal branded on the hip. I therefore saved the skin to carry into the owner. At this place I remained during the following day. Again, moving onward in two days' travel, I arrived at a farmhouse. The country through which we passed was strikingly contrasted with the rocky and sandy deserts through which we had so long been traveling. There we had passed many high mountains, rocky and barren, many plains whose sands drank up the waters of the river in spring where our need was the greatest. There sometimes a solitary antelope bounded by to vex our hunger, and the stunted, useless sedge grew as in mockery of the surrounding sterility. There for many days we had traveled weary, hungry, and thirsty, drinking from springs that increased our thirst, and looking in vain for a boundary of the interminable waste of sands. But now the scene was changed, and whether it was its own real beauty, or the contrast with what we had seen, it certainly seemed to us enchantment. Our path was through a fertile and well-watered valley, and the herds of cattle and the bands of wild horses as they sniffed the wind and rushed wildly across our way reminded me of the plains of the buffalo east of the mountains that seemed to me as a home or of the cattle of the more distant prairies of Missouri and Illinois.
Even in the idea that we were approaching the abode of comparative civilization, there was a pleasure not, however, entirely unmixed with dread, for we knew not how we might be received. As we advanced, the white Brant and Mallard were seen in great numbers it being now their season, and we passed a farm on a creek where a number of Indians were at work. They gazed and gazed again, considering us no doubt as strange objects in which they were not much in error. When it is considered that they were not accustomed to see white men walking with horses packed as mine were with furs traps, saddlebags, guns and blankets, and everything so different from anything they had ever seen, and add to this our ragged and miserable appearance, I should not have been surprised if they had run off at first sight, for I have often been treated in that manner by savages. Arrived at the farmhouses, I was kindly received by an elderly man, an Indian who spoke Spanish, and immediately asked me if I would have a bullock killed. I answered that I would, and away rode two young Indians in a moment. It being the custom in this country, as I have since learned to keep a horse or horses constantly tied at the door, saddled and bridled and, of course, ready to mount at a moment's warning. In a short time, the Indians returned, bringing a cow as fast as she could gallop. She was held between the two horsemen by ropes thrown over her horns, and having the other end fast to the pommel of the Spanish saddle, one riding before and the other behind, she was forced along without the power of resistance. They were anxious that I should shoot the cow which I did. Novel as the scenery of this country was to me, it seemed that we ourselves were a still greater wonder to our semi-civilized friends. As I afterwards learned, they wondered how Indians could be so white, having no idea that civilized people lived in the direction from which we came. It was also a great wonder to them that we had guns and other articles, and more than all that there should be with us one of the people of reason, this being the name by which they were learned to distinguish Spaniards from Indians, and which they readily applied to one of my men who spoke Spanish. The farmhouse consisted of two buildings, each about 100 feet long, twenty feet wide and twelve feet high, placed so as to form two sides of a square. The walls are of unburnt brick about two feet thick, and at intervals of fifteen feet, loopholes are left for the admission of light. The roofs were thatched. It should be premised that I had at this time but a vague idea of the peculiarities of the country in which my fortune had placed me. I therefore was in the dark, as to the manner in which I should conduct myself, and determined to be guided by circumstances as they should transpire. In pursuance of this plan, when the old overseer asked me if I was not going to write to father, I told him I was, and immediately sat down and wrote a few lines briefly stating where I was from, and the reason of my being there, an Indian mounting one of the horses that are always in readiness, took my note and was off in an instant. In about an hour, the answer was returned by a man who the overseer told me was the commandant, but in fact a corporal. He asked me how I did and congratulated me that I had escaped the Gentiles and got into a Christian country, and offering me some seegers made with paper according to the common custom of the country when I would take one, he insisted that I should take the bunch. He then presented the note from the father, written in Latin, and as I could not read his Latin nor he my English, it seemed that we were not likely to become general correspondents. I, however, ascertained that he wished me to ride to the mission, so giving Mr. Rogers instructions how to proceed in my absence, I took my interpreter and in company with the corporal and a soldier moved on at the gate that appears quite common in this country, a gallop passing large fields laid out on both sides of the road and fenced with posts set in the ground, with rails tied to them by means of strong pieces of raw hide, there being also thousands of cattle skulls in rows on each side of the road, conveying the idea that we were approaching an immense slaughter yard. Arrived in view of a building of ancient and castle-like appearance, and not knowing why I was brought there or who I was, to see the current of my thoughts ran so rapidly through my mind as to deprive me of the power of coming to any conclusion, so that when we passed in front of the building and the corporal, after pointing to an old man sitting in the portico and observing that there was the father immediately rode off, I was left quite embarrassed, hardly knowing how to introduce myself. Observing this, I presume the father took me by hand and quite familiarly asked me to walk in, making at the same time many inquiries. Soon some bread and cheese were brought in and some rum of which I drank to please the father, but much against my own taste. 
I then related to him as well as in my power the course of my being in that country, but it was being to him a thing so entirely new, and my interpreter perhaps not giving a correct translation of my words, he was not able to comprehend the subject, and told me there was an American residing in the vicinity for whom he would send as he spoke good Spanish, and on his arrival we might have a good understanding. In the meantime, he told me to make myself as contented as possible and consider myself at home. He ordered the steward to show me to a room about twenty feet square in which there was a bed taking possession of it. I was left alone to reflect on my singular situation for about two hours, when the bell ringing for supper a boy came and invited me in. The old father invited me to pass up next to him. We were seated on a long bench with a back to it, one of these occupying each side of the table. On the opposite side of the table sat a Spanish gentleman and a father from the neighboring village of the Angels, and the steward of the mission. At my side sat my interpreter. As soon as we were seated, the father said benediction, and each one in the most hurried manner asked the blessing of heaven. And even while the last words were pronouncing, the fathers were reaching for the different dishes. About a dozen Indian boys were in attendance who passing the different dishes to the fathers, they helping themselves and passing them to the next. Our knives and forks, according to the common custom of the country, were rolled up in a napkin and laid by the side of the plates. The supper consisted principally of meats and an abundance of wine. Before the cloth was removed, cigars were passed around. I may be excused for being this particular in this table scene when it is recollected that it was a long time since I had had the pleasure of sitting at a table and never before in such company. November 28, 1826. My party arrived and I had my things put into the room which I occupied. The corporal, who was called Commandant, came to me and after a few preparatory compliments observed that the best thing I could do with my guns would be to put them in his charge where they would be safe for said the strangers visiting you will be constantly handling them, they being a kind with which they are unacquainted. I thanked him for his kindness and gave him the arms, though I knew he was influenced by a motive very different from the one assigned. Twenty-ninth, just at sunrise, Mr. Rogers and myself were sent for, showed forward to the table and served with tea bread and cheese. The father was not present for at that time, he was at his devotions. It may perhaps be well for me in this place to give a view of some facts that were in part learned after this time, anticipating my story, that my ideas may be the more readily understood. California was first settled by missionaries of the Order of St. Francis about sixty years since. These missions are scattered over the country and include in their several jurisdictions nearly all the natives of the country. The number of Indians attached to each mission varies from 400 to 2,000. These establishments with their dependencies include about three-fourths of the inhabitants of California. The place at which I was for the time located was the mission of St. Gabriel. The situation of St. Gabriel is pleasant, the prospect to the north embracing a considerable range of mountains at the distance of 12 miles on the south low hills and on the east and west a smooth country covered with grass. The soil in the vicinity of the mission has the appearance of great fertility presenting a gentle slope to the southeast. The hills produce pine of different kinds, and at their feet, groves of low oak and small walnuts. The streams are skirted with cottonwood, ash willow, small buckeye, and wild grapevines. Two thousand acres of land fenced in the manner I have before described and so situated as to be easily watered by a small creek that runs through it, producing an abundance of wheat beans, peas, and some corn. An extensive vineyard and orchards of apples, peach, pear, and olive trees. Some figs and a beautiful grove of about 400 orange trees render the mission of St. Gabriel a scene on which the eye cannot fail to rest with pleasure. On the beautiful lands of the neighborhood are grazing immense herds of cattle and large bands of horses. The buildings of the mission form a hollow square. The church on the southeast and the guardhouse on the southwest corner, the several sides being occupied by the father's rooms, office, dining room, apartments for strangers, storehouses, granaries, soap factory, distillery, blacksmith, carpenters, and cooper shops. The shops for the manufacture of blankets and lodging rooms for the unmarried women. At a short distance from the square, the intermediate space being unfenced, there is a street lined with small buildings on both sides. These are occupied by the Indians of the mission who have families. 
At eleven o'clock, the father came and invited us to dinner. We accompanied him to the office adjoining the dining room, and after taking a glass of gin and some bread and cheese, we seated ourselves at the table, which was furnished with mutton, beef, chickens, potatoes, beans, and peas cooked in different ways. Wine in abundance made our reverend fathers appear to me quite merry. An express had been forwarded by the commandant to the governor at San Diego. My two Indian guides were put in prison immediately on my arrival charged with being runaways from the mission. They were about 16 years of age, and from what I saw of them, I thought them fine, honest, and well-disposed boys. November 30th, Sunday. A wedding at church, but I did not attend being a Protestant. I thought it might not be agreeable to the Catholics. The new married couple dined with us, the bride and her sister being the only females present, two or three young men attended with the groom. Mr. Rogers and myself in our unfashionable dress would have very willingly absented ourselves, but no excuses would be received. Our dinner consisted of of more than the usual number of dishes. Dried grapes were served as a desert. A dozen Indians were playing on violins and the soldiers were firing their muskets at the door. After dinner, I spoke to the commandant for another room for my men, which was readily provided. I also proposed that instead of furnishing my men with their provision ready cooked, as had been the case heretofore, they should receive the material and cook them to their own taste. To this he assented, but observed that they might as well as not have an Indian to assist them. Flour meat beans and sea were provided in abundance. From this time, nothing material occurred for several days. Mr. Chapman, the American spoken of by the father, came from the village of the Angels, accompanied by Captain Anderson of the brig Olive Branch and the supercargo Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott being a good translator, I was enabled to make my situation fully known. I soon ascertained that nothing could be done until the arrival of an answer from the governor at San Diego. Besides the above-named gentlemen, there came to St. Gabriel at different times two others who spoke good English. John Baptiste Bonifacio, a Portuguese residing at St. Francisco, and on his way to St. Diego, the other Senor Martinez, a native of South America and formerly in good circumstances. But being a royalist, lost his property and sought a retreat among the fathers in California who are generally secret friends of Ferdinand. Senor Martinez had lately been called to Mexico and was then on his way he appeared to be a man of science and business. You will find says he, it very difficult to make the governor comprehend your business. He has been raised without knowing the hand that fed him as a gentleman, and those Mexican gentlemen know very little of business of any kind and much less of yours. He may perhaps detain you here a long time. He will not consider the expense of the wages of your men, nor your anxiety to join your partners. Improving the opportunity offered by my presence, I learned from Father Sanchez that at the different farms belonging to the mission, St. Gabriel, there were 40,000 head of cattle, 2,000 horses, three or 400 head of sheep, and a great many hogs of these last that make little use. There are but few white men at this place. Neither could it be expected there would be many in California, for Father Sanchez told me that no white woman had ever come there to live. There are attached to the mission of St. Gabriel about Indian inhabitants who are kept in the strictest order being punished severely for the most trifling offense or neglect. They are whipped like slaves, the whip being used by an Indian, a soldier standing by with a sword to see that it is faithfully done. Having passed the age of puberty, the two sexes, if unmarried, are kept separate, being at night shut up in different apartments. The work of the day having their tasks, the ringing of the bells in the morning, which is quite early, all the Indians go to church. And after prayers, the overseers of the various branches of work receive their orders from the principal overseer and move off immediately to their several employments. An old man from the Angel Village being at the mission invited me to visit him at his house, and two or three days after sent his son with horses. I went taking with me my interpreter and was very kindly received by my friend Francisco Abela. The angel village in which my friend resided contained seventy or eighty houses, the walls of mud or unburnt brick and the roofs of thatch or tile. They were general, small, and few of them cleaner than they should be. This village is about ten miles southwest from St. Gabriel. The inhabitants cultivate but little ground, depending on their cattle for subsistence. They are generally poor, but a few families are rich in cattle horses and mules, and among these, Senor Francisco Abela and his brother Don Ignacio are perhaps the richest.
In California, as in Spain, the siesta after dinner is fashionable. They generally sleep two or three hours. The Californians are excellent horsemen when on a swift horse they catch a wild steer or horse with the greatest ease. They are seldom seen on foot, but mount a horse to go even 200 yards and always carry with them a strong rope made from pieces of ox hide braided, which is called a lars. It is seven or eight fathoms in length, with a loop at the end for the purpose of forming a noose. The Spaniard mounted on a swift horse with his larce in hand, holding it so as to form the noose about four feet in diameter and swinging it around his head to keep it connected, pursues the wild cattle and horses of that country, and arriving at the proper distance while both pursued and pursuer are at utmost speed, throws his noose with such precision as to generally succeed in fastening it to the animal in the intended place while at the same time with his left hand, he takes a turn around the pommel of the saddle, which is made high for that purpose, with the end of the rope remaining in his hand. If the animal pursued is a horse, he is caught around the neck and is soon choked down. If a steer, he is caught by the horns, and generally by two persons, one riding before the animal, and one behind holding him between them by their respective larses with the power of resistance. If it is the object to throw the animal down, they throw for the feet, and having caught and fastened the rope to the saddle, giving the horse a start, the animal's feet are taken from under him at once. In this manner, they can take almost any animal in the country without accepting even the elk. But the principal use of this daring and active exercise is the catching of the wild horse and wild cattle that range the country in great numbers. I am also informed that when a bear can be found in the open country, they are taken in this manner. But they do not attempt this adventure singly. Of the truth of this, I have some doubts. The only bear found in this country are the grizzly bear smaller than those of the mountains, yet notwithstanding a formidable animal and possessing sufficient strength as I think to take hold of the lars when noosed around the neck and tear it from the saddle or break it in an instant. December 8, 1826. At this time, the mercury ranges from 50 to 70. Today, the corporal received orders to forward me to San Diego to pay a visit to His Excellency Josea Maria de Aquiondia. Captain Cunningham of the ship Courier of Boston arrived about the same time from San Diego. December 9, 1826. Captain Cunningham had been trading on this coast since the preceding July, exchanging dry goods groceries and hardware for hide and specie. The population not admitting of a wholesale business, the sales are made in retail while passing along the coast from Acapulco to St. Francisco. At that time, he expected to be on the coast about a year longer. He spoke Spanish and manifested the most friendly disposition and a willingness to render me all the assistance in his power. It was therefore with great pleasure that I learned he was about to return to San Diego and that we could travel in company. At 11 o'clock, all preparations being made, we started. My horses were furnished by government, some being driven along for the purpose of having a change. A soldier was sent by the commandant for a guide to take charge of the loose horses and catch one if necessary. Just before starting, the commandant took care to tell me that he was instructed to send a good and careful soldier. In this country, horses are so plenty and cheap, and the people have so little feeling for these noble animals, as I shall soon show that they indulge freely in the common disposition for fast riding secure that when a horse is no longer able to travel, another may be cheaply and easily procured. We therefore fell in with the spirit of the time and people and moved off at a gallop over a fine level country. Four miles from St. Gabriel, we crossed a stream 50 yards wide and shallow and sandy. On the right, a country gently undulating extended to the ocean a distance of 20 or 30 miles, and on the left a range of high and rough hills. About 18 miles from the first mentioned creek, we crossed another 80 yards wide in appearance like the first, and three miles further came to a farm. In this distance we had passed many herds of cattle belonging to the residents of the Angel Village and some thousands of wild horses. The wild horses become so abundant at times as to eat the grass quite clean. My guide informed me that the inhabitants of the village and of the vicinity collect whenever they consider the country overstocked and build a large and strong pen with a small entrance and two wings extending from the entrance some distance to the right and left. 
Then, mounting their swiftest horses, they scour the country, and surrounding large bands, they drive them into the enclosure by hundreds. They will there perhaps larse a few of the handsomest and take them out of the pack. A horse selected in this manner is immediately thrown down and altered, blindfolded, saddled, and haltered. For the Californians always commence with the halter. The horse is then allowed to get up and a man is mounted. When he is firmly fixed in his seat and the halter in his hand, an assistant takes off the blind, the several men on horseback with handkerchiefs to frighten and some with whips to whip, raise the yell and away they go. The poor horse, having been so severely punished and frightened, does not think of flouncing but dashes off at no slow rate for a trial of his speed. After running until he is exhausted and finding he cannot get rid of his enemies, he gives up. He is then kept tied for two or three days, saddled, and rode occasionally, and if he proves docile, he is tied by the neck to a tame horse until he becomes attached to the company and then turned loose. But if a horse from the moment he is taken from the pen proves refractory, they do not trouble themselves with him long, but release him from his bondage by thrusting a knife to his heart. Cruel as this fate may seem, it is a mercy compared to that of the hundreds left in the pack, for they are shut up to die a death most lingering and most horrible, enclosed within a narrow space without the possibility of escape, and without a morsel to eat, they gradually lose their strength and sink to the ground, making at time vain efforts to regain their feet. And when at last all powerful hunger has left them but the strength to raise their heads from the dust with which they are soon to mingle their eyes that are becoming dim with the approach of death, may catch a glimpse of green and wide-spread pastures and winding streams while they are perishing from want. One by one they die, and at length the last and most powerful sinks down among his companions to the plain. No man of feeling can think of such a scene without surprise, indignation, and pity. Pity for the noblest of animals dying from want in the midst of fertile fields. Indignation and surprise that men are so barbarous and unfeeling. A fact so disgraceful to the Californians was not credited from a single narrator, but has since been corroborated. But to return to this digression, the farm of which I have before spoken belonged to Don Thomas. The remainder of his name I have forgotten. He was not at home, but his wife invited us into a house of two or three rooms and informed us that her husband was soon expected. We therefore concluded to wait his arrival. I observed some sugarcane growing in the garden, which appeared quite thrifty. It was not long before we were called to eat the attention of these people, being in that respect truly proverbial. We sat down to a table where the tablecloth napkins and plates were clean and the spoons of silver, but neither knives or forks were there, for the common people of this country seldom have these articles. Our repast consisted of a hash highly seasoned with pepper, tortillas, pancakes, and wine. The blessing was asked by a boy eight or nine years old standing at the end of the table with his hands raised. Not being pronounced in the usual hurried manner, it had much more the appearance of devotion, I then thought as now, that some of the learned fathers might learn the air of devotion, if not the substance, from this little boy. Soon after we had finished eating, Don Thomas arrived, having ascertained our wants. He said, as his horses were some distance off, we could have to remain all night, or if we were in a great hurry, we could start at one or two o'clock in the morning, by which time he could have the horses. At two o'clock, we started on our journey, and at eight o'clock arrived at the mission of San Juan, a distance of about twenty-five miles. The first part of this distance being traveled in the night, I could not so well form an idea of its appearance. But it seemed much like that we had passed, and judging from the noise the wild horses made in running when scared off by our approach, or when taking the wind, I would think them as numerous as in the country before described. As we approached the ocean, the country became much more hilly, the mission of San Juan is about a mile from the ocean in a country hilly and barren. The buildings are similar in construction and arrangement to those at St. Gabriel. In the year 1811, the church of this mission was nearly destroyed by an earthquake since which time service has been performed in one of the smaller buildings. The number of Indians is not great at this mission, nor is it more than half as rich as that of St. Gabriel. On our arrival at San Juan, the people were at church as soon as service was over. The steward invited us to take a cup of chocolate, which is a beverage of which the Spaniards are very fond, and of which the higher class make great use particularly in the morning. 
To Americans, they general offer tea as they have an idea that we are very fond of it. I have seen them grind tea as they would coffee, which is an evidence that they do not make much use of it. My soldier presented his instructions to the corporal at the mission, who soon supplied us with fresh horses and a new soldier. We then pushed on, our way leading us for some miles directly along the beach of the ocean, the country back rough and hilly, to an old and nearly deserted mission, there being but an overseer and a few Indians to occupy it. From this place, our course was southeast through hills covered with bastard cedar, till just at night when we arrived at the handsome mission of San Luis Rey, a distance from St. Juan, I think about 50 miles. This mission is beautifully situated on a rising piece of ground between two small creeks. The building were similar to those at San Gabriel, but appeared better from having been lately whitewashed. On the east side, a portico extended the whole length of the buildings. Remaining there during the night and in the morning, making an exchange of soldiers and horses, we proceeded on through a hilly country about 30 miles to San Diego. When we arrived at the Presidio, I was taken to the office of the lieutenant, and on the arrival of an interpreter procured by Captain Cunningham, I was informed that I could not see the gov until the next day. Presently, Captain Dana of the ship Waverly from the Sandwich Islands came and invited me to his quarters. Having ascertained that I would be at liberty to choose my residence, I accompanied him to a private house about one quarter of a mile from the Presidio, where Captain Cunningham and himself always put up when on shore. Captain Dana was a Bostonian and a very friendly man. The following day I went to see the Gov or General, as he is known here by both of those titles, although when at Mexico, I am told he ranked as a major. When I let him know my situation and my wants, he told me it would be some days before he could give me an answer, as it would be necessary to call a council of officers, etc. In the meantime, he observed I should be furnished with a room and every necessary with such clothing as I wanted for as I had on my leather hunting shirt. He readily supposed a change would be desirable. I thanked him for his kindness, but told him as Captain Cunningham was my countryman, I would prefer remaining with him and being under obligations to him for any supplies I might want. He acquiesced, and I accompanied Captain Cunningham on board his ship courier and was told to consider it my home. I there became acquainted with Mr. Shaw, the supercargo Mr. Theodore Cunningham, first mate, a brother of the captain, and Mr. Blackter's second mate. The Presidio, Presidio is a name applied to a town which is the residence of the governor. Of San Diego is about three miles from the harbor in latitude. The buildings are in a square somewhat like the missions but lower and much decayed. They are on a side hill sloping toward the ocean. The residence of the governor is on the east, and his portico commands a fine view of the harbor and the ocean. San Diego contains about 200 inhabitants exclusive of the mission of the same name, which is about six miles northeast on a small stream which flows into the harbor. The general aspect of the country is hilly and barren with some scrubby oak and pine on the hills, but very little grass. The harbor of San Diego is formed by two peninsulas, one of which projects into the ocean directly opposite the Presidio. The entrance is quite narrow, but having a great depth of water and being entirely protected from winds, this harbor is considered very safe. A blockhouse or fort on the peninsula commands the entrance of the harbor. Several days having passed, I called again on His Excellency, but could get no answer. He told me he did not know what to do, he must see my journal, and he likewise took a copy of my chart and license. He even asked me what business I had to make maps of their country. I told him my maps were made merely to assist me in traveling, and must of necessity be very incorrect, as I was destitute of the means for making celestial observations. From this time I was detained day after day and week after week. Sometimes, he told me, I must wait until he could receive orders from Mexico, and at other times, he thought it desirable that I should go to Mexico, and would then come to the conclusion that it was necessary to send myself and party to Mexico. Whilst my fate depended on the caprice of a man who appeared not to be certain of anything or of the course his duty required him to pursue and only governed by the changing whims of the hour, my feelings can only be duly appreciated by those who have been in the same situation. I knew the eager expectations with which my party at St. Gabriel looked for my return. I felt the ruinous effect which my detention had on my business and the gloomy apprehensions which my protracted absence would cause to my partners in the distant mountains. 
But these considerations never came within the sphere of His Excellency's comprehension, and I was harassed by numerous and contradictory expedient and ruinous delays until about the 1st of January, when His Excellency informed me that if the Americans who were in the harbor of San Diego masters of vessels, officers, and supercargo— would sign a paper certifying that what I gave as the reason of my coming to that country they believed to be substantially correct. I might then have permission to trade for such things as I wanted, and to return the same route which I had come in. I had applied for permission to travel directly north that I might arrive as soon as possible on the territory of the United States. But this he would not grant, insisting that I should travel the same route by which I had come. The certificate was made out and signed by Captain William H. Cunningham, Theodore Cunningham, and Mr. Shaw of the ship courier Captain Dana, and Mr. Robbins of the Waverly Captain Henderson, and Mr. Scotty of the brig, belonging to Bags and Company of Lima. The governor then gave me a passport and license to purchase such supplies as I wanted. I was allowed the privilege of staying but four days after my arrival at St. Gabriel, and strictly forbid to make any more maps for said the gov. Even our own citizens cannot make maps, unless permission is obtained from Mexico. Although the governor had obliged me to go to San Diego, yet he would not furnish me with horses for my return. But I felt this injustice the less as Captain Cunningham offered me a passage on board of his ship which would sail in a few days for Point Pedro, the nearest anchorage to St. Gabriel. I accepted this offer the more readily, as it would enable me to have my supplies prepared during the passage, for they were to be procured from Captain Cunningham. I had found the governor to more than sustain the character given of him by Senor Martinez, and it will be readily supposed that I left him without any other regret than what I felt for the time lost in doing business that might have been done in a few hours, or might as well have been left undone. Everything being ready, we sailed and on the third day came to anchor on the east side of the island of St. Catalina. The island of Santa Catalina is about 20 west-southwest from St. Pedro. It is about 18 miles long and 8 broad, having high hills covered with grass, wild onions, and some small timber. Captain Cunningham had a house on the island for the purpose of salting hides. He was about to take some cow's hogs and fowls for the use of the men there employed. After remaining at the island two nights, we sailed for St. Pedro, which is merely a good anchorage or roadstead. Several cannon were fired as a signal to a farmer that lived eight or ten miles off, who usually made it his business to come with horses to take people up to the Pueblo or to St. Gabriel. As the expected horses did not come, we started on foot and continued until we procured horses to take us to the Pueblo Los Angeles or the Angel's Village. We remained all night at the village, and in the morning I called on my friend Sector Abella and made arrangements for the purchase of horses, and then in company with the captain, Mr. Chapman, and Mr. Shaw. I moved on to the mission of St. Gabriel, where I found my party all well. I must not omit the cordial welcome with which I was received by Father Jose Sanchez. He seemed to rejoice in my good fortune and well sustained the favorable opinion I had formed of him. You are now, says he, to pass again that miserable country, and if you do not prepare yourself well for it, it is your own fault. If there is anything that you want and that I have let me know, and it shall be at your service. I thanked him for his kindness and made every exertion to start as soon as possible. I called on the commandant to ascertain whether I could stay longer than the four days allowed in my passport. He told me a day or two would not make any difference. During my absence, one of my Indian guides who had been imprisoned was released by death and the other was kept in the guardhouse at night and at hard labor during the day, having the menial service of the guardhouse to perform. I took a convenient opportunity to speak to the father in his behalf. He told me he would do all in his power for his release. From his expression, I took the idea that government had ordered their imprisonment. The fathers had given me some iron, and my smith had made in the shop of the mission as many horseshoes as I wanted. He had also given me some saddles and the leather for rigging them. It was on the 10th of January, 1827, that I returned from St. Diego. The next day, I went down to the courier, got my supplies, and returned to the Pueblo, Los Angeles, and put up with my friend Effabella, commenced buying horses, and in a short time had as many as I wanted. When I left the courier, I took leave of my friend, Captain Cunningham. Should chance ever throw this in his way, he will perhaps be gratified to find that I have not forgotten his name or his friendship. 
that I recollect with the most grateful feelings his kind offices in times that made them doubly valuable, and in a country to which he had traveled by the unmarked and perilous paths of the ocean, while my way had been through an unknown land over mountains and parched inhospitable plains. Meeting in a distant country by routes so different gave an instance of that restless enterprise that has led and is now leading our countrymen to all parts of the world that has made them travelers on every ocean until it can now be said there is not a breeze of heaven but spreads an American flag. In this place I will give some ideas in relation to this country of a general nature which may perhaps be interesting. California, as I have before observed, was settled by missionaries of the Order of St. Francis about sixty years since. They established missions in various parts of the country, and in civilizing the Indians, and in imparting to them the benefits of religion, they found the opportunity to establish over them the most absolute power. The number of Indians under the control of each mission varies from 300 to 2,000, which are under the care and direction of a priest who is styled the father and who sometimes has a subordinate or two. The Indian has no individual right of property, although he is told that he has an interest in his labors and in the proceeds of the farms and herds of the mission. He has not the right or at least the power to marry without the consent of the father, for the sexes are not allowed to labor together during the day and at night they are shut up in separate apartments. And although since the revolution they are by express provision declared free, and the fathers were ordered to inform them of the fact, yet it does not appear that it has made any material change in their situation. It is not uncharitable, perhaps, to suppose that the fathers, in making known to them their right to freedom, have done it in such a way that it appeared to them, from their ignorance, a change not to be desired. They said to them, I am told, you live in a good country, you have plenty to eat to drink and to where your father takes care of you and will pray for you and show you the way to heaven. On the other hand, if you go away from the missions, where will you find so good a country who will give you cloths? Or where will you find a father to feed you, to take care of you, and to pray for you? Such arguments as these coming from a source long respected and venerated and acting on the minds of ignorant and superstitious beings has had the effect to keep the Indians in their real slavery without the desire of freedom. Whatever the causes may be, the fact is certain that very few have availed themselves of the privilege of the revolution. The missions setting aside their religious professions are in fact large farming and grazing establishment conducted at the will of the father, who is in a certain degree responsible to the president of his order residing in the province. The immediate supervision of the different kinds of business is confided to overseers, who are generally half-breeds raised in a manner somewhat better than the common mass, under the eye of the father from whom they sometimes receive a limited education, and to whom in some instances they might with strict propriety apply the name of father. The Indians are employed in the different kinds of work attendant upon farming and herding of stock, the manufacturing of blankets of coarse wool, which form their principal clothing, the making of soap, of brick, and in distilling. Their labor does not appear to be unreasonably hard. They are required to attend church regularly every morning, after which they immediately move off under the direction of their respective overseers to the business of the day. Left St. Gabriel and moved on toward St. Bernardino, the most distant farmhouse belonging to the mission, being about sixty miles from St. Gabriel and a few miles south of the route by which I had come in. In three days I arrived at St. Bernardino, where I remained several days drying beef and breaking my young horses, as well as looking for some that had strayed away. On leaving Father Sanchez, he directed me to kill beef and as much as I could dry, and to take meal peas, corn wheat, or anything I wanted, and such quantities as I chose, in this case, as in many others, evincing the most benevolent regard for my welfare. Occupied in these preparations for continuing my journey, I remained until the first day of February, 1827, when I left Bernardino, accompanied by two or three Indians, and moved on to the place where I had passed through the mountain and first came in sight of cattle as I came into the beautiful valley of St. Gabriel, and there I encamped. The Indians that came with me thus far killed a beef. During the night it snowed, and in the morning I again moved on nearly north, crossing my old track, and on the 3D day from Bernardino I had got on the east side of the mountain where there was no snow. 
It was in this place I first saw a tree I have named the Dirk Pear Tree. It grows from 15 to 30 feet high, 12 inches in diameter, porous wood bark, rough like the walnut. The leaf, like the blade of a dirk, is about 8 or 10 inches long, the point resembling that of a porcupine quill.